Let's receive our offering tonight. If you guys need an envelope, raise your hand. You know how we do this. We're going to honor the Lord. We're going to put money in this box to pay off this building, right? And next week, Stephen's going to give us uh, some information, right? It's next week, next Sunday. And don't forget, we're going to fix a driveway. So I'm telling you, expect something extra. And when something extra comes in, don't stand there and go, duh, what's this for? <laughs> don't eat the seed. Don't eat the seed, all right? Okay, stand to your feet then. Praise God. Hey, the tigers come from behind victory today. We like the tigers. You get old enough, a good pastor will take you to a ball game. <laughs> Right? Come here, Oliver. Pray over the offering. Come here. You don't want to? All right, you'll, you'll pray at the end of prayer or service, okay? All right, or you don't pray at all. No prayer for you. He's, is it really? I mean, he's always been bold when I've asked him. All right, Father, thank you for this night. Thank you. We worship you and declare the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want or lack any single good thing. Thank you, Father, that every need we have is met, is met according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That includes a mortgage. That includes a driveway. That includes every other thing we need for ministry and success. Thank you for an open heaven and I pray over your people tonight that they would come upon suddenly and there'd be surprises and bonuses and, and just money miracles in their life. I thank you for it. I curse the spirit of poverty from our church. And I thank you for the fire of God burning in every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. And thank you for... We do thank you that we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, that your word is alive in us, and you're leading us and guiding us by your Spirit. I thank you for the comfort and peace of the Holy Spirit upon your people today. And Lord, I thank you that you're in our future. You know what's going to happen this week, and you're going to prepare us, tip us off, or warn us of things to come. And we are grateful for that. In Jesus' name, may your people receive your word tonight. And everybody said? Amen. Everybody said? Amen. I didn't want, I shouldn't, I, I'll clarify that. When I want a Lutheran amen, I'll say, and everybody gave a Lutheran amen. And you do that real soft. You say amen. And if I want a real amen, amen. So be it. It's done. All right, give somebody a high five and say he's, he's talking to you. You! Thank you, Charity. Ah, ah, ah. How I love your name. Shela bando brosi bakai. Glory. We didn't say go for a walk now. 
Okay, if it's for Ivan, then that's worth it. You may be seated. Open up to the epistle of the Philippians. Okay. Philippians. It's a great little book. Full of juicy stuff. Stuff that save you from harm and pain and hell. Did you find Philippians yet? Chapter 3. Aren't I good at that, giving you the address for it? Verse 1. Finally, my brethren. I said finally, but there's two more chapters. <laughs> it gives hope. All right, we're almost done. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Are we capable of doing that? Didn't we do that today already? Now, is rejoicing in the Lord something that's only done in a corporate church service? Or is this something you can do independently? I highly recommend it. It changes the atmosphere. It changes your attitude. And it drives those demons crazy. All right, let's try that again, see if I can get past that. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Let's look at this. For me to write the same thing to you, it's not tedious, but for you it is safe. For you it is safe. Now, I'll show you what this emphasizes. I've called this a little outline I work off of. It's called Again. Um, one of my son's baseball coaches, I saw him not too long ago. Uh, he's retired now, but Nick really liked playing ball for this guy, and he's a great coach. And uh, as we were talking, he's, he's helping this new coach. He's teaching him what he knows about it without being the head coach. But I said, you know, repetition is a pastor and a coach's best friend. It is. To, uh, some of you have heard me say the same stories and examples and even preach some of the same sermons, and it's not that uh, I don't know what's going on. It's just I believe in the power of repetition. I would like to be under the impression that every word spoken from this pulpit, you get it automatically and you hold it. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you could be distracted from what's happening in your life. Or it, it's just interest, interesting how the human brain works. But yet I've heard Dr. Barkley tell stories I love his stories. I've heard him preach the same sermon over and over, and it was just different in each setting. Uh, and so there's, there's nothing wrong with repeating it. I guess as far as coaching and pastoring concerned, uh, repetition is parenting's key to success too. Unless you're like Lexi, you probably only had to tell her one time how to do something, right? Right, just one time and she got it down pat. Evan was the same way if I remember the stories. Anna was that way, little shining star, right? I know I was not. I thought I could bend the rules. and but it, So that's one of the most powerful things you can do is, is the repetition. But for you, it is safe. Dr. Summerall told me one time, he said that at least every two years, you should go over your, your major doctrines of your church, like salvation, the rapture, healing, the Holy Spirit. Because uh, he said, if you don't, you're going to have a church full of people that only know sermons and not what we actually believe in. And so I did that last year. I'll do it again starting next year. Or I might weave a couple of those sermons in there because they can, they can kind of be tedious and boring. But not when I do it. I liven them up a little bit. Okay, I put a little pixie dust on it. My PSA touch, that's correct. But for you, it is safe. Repetition leads to safety. Isn't that one of the good things about coming to church? Uh, it's not like we do the same thing time and time again, but at least you know you're in a safe place. There's going to be a couple things that happen. You are going to worship God. You are going to hear a word-based sermon or teaching outline. You're going to have prayer, and it all just depends on what flavor it comes out that night. You know, you're not going to show up here next Sunday and we're going to have a pony out front and decide to ride ponies. 
even though we might attract people with ponies, and we'd be known as the Pony Church. But then we'd have to have that stinking pony here every Sunday to get those same pony people to come back. Could I advertise we're going to have ponies and elephants and all that? And, and then when they all show up all excited, I go, we got to call at the last minute. Or that be fibbing? Then I'll have one of my assistants do it. <laughs> okay, we won't do that. We'll, we'll witness to people. We'll invite people. We'll expect people. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to take people from other churches. I believe there's enough unchurched people in Kalamazoo to fill this building multiple times. I believe if we could just scrape up all the backsliders. They're a little easier because they're like half trained. We got to find where the, where the crack in their foundation is at and repair that. And then we may build again. Amen. But for you it is safe. Mm. Mm -mm. Go to Hebrews 5. Did you ever hear Doc Barkley tell the story about his friend Chubby Chubby? Isn't that great story? You, have you heard it? A couple times? It wasn't as bad the second time, was it? Or you said, oh no, here he comes. Yeah? He had a friend, and there's a reason he was called Chubby Chubby, but they took him to the county fair, and Chubby Chubby ate, what, corn dogs and elephant ears, and, and then they put him on whatever ride it is that goes around and around, and, and uh, it didn't work out good for Chubby or the people on the ground. <laughs> All right, well, it's a true story, Doc. Wouldn't make anything up. Let's see here. What's that? Five. Verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, that means there's a timetable. That means there's a schedule. There's one in the natural. There's one in the spirit. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. What did they need to have teach to them again? The basics, the foundation stuff. Not, not the big, heavy, spooky revelation, but they needed to hear about prayer and about faith and about repentance about church attendance, about tithing. That's interesting, isn't it? You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. I wonder if, if that could have been written where you should be teaching others the principles of God, but now you've got to go back. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only in, of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now verse 12 I'm going to zero in on. Remember we're talking about again in repetition. And uh, I pray that whether it's Dr. Barclay or whoever we have in here or anybody that's above me says to me, by this time, Pastor Scott, you should be doing this. Would you like to hear that over your pastor? By this time, you ought to be over fear. By this time, you ought to be able to take an offering without feeling guilty. By this time, you should be able to overcome that temptation. For this time, you ought to be able to teach them how to get out of this mess they're in. I don't want to ever want that to happen, so that motivates me. It just motivates me to say, I, I, can, I can stay, take care of myself here. But this is a statement Kevy and I often say to each other, by this time. Sometimes I look at believers and think, by this time you should, you should be standing independent. You should be excuse-free for all the stuff in your life. You, you, sh you should have some battle scars and some victories. And, but by this, this time, we've got to start all over again. Church on Sunday morning at 10. Yeah. Pre-service prayer 945. Bring a Bible. Okay? Pay attention. Go to bed early the night before. Put your clothes out so there's no drama in the morning. Okay? See, that's, a, that's what I would say to somebody new. 
And, and I think I'm saying it to somebody in here. By this time, you should know how to sing, how to pray, how to overcome. Now, that all depends on what level you're at because if, if you can envision a rope hanging from this ceiling to the floor, back in the days when I was in high school, we'd had that in our gym and we get, used to climb up it until the insurance company said, no, no, little Johnny loses his grip. He's going to free fall. But we had that little mat. It was a little mat. And I only climbed that rope when the wrestlers weren't in the gymnasium because those dudes are crazy. They like pulling on the rope and doing stuff. And so you just have to be smarter than the wrestlers. I would say there's free pizza in the cafeteria, and they'd all run down there, and I'd... And then, then I'd be done, and I would get my A. May, may this be a check in your spirit by this time. Where, Lord, where am I supposed to be? But if you envision that rope, we're all on that rope. We're just in different locations of it. Some are up top of the top of the line. Some are just at the bottom learning how to do it. Some are in the middle. Some kind of choose to grow uh, per crisis motivation. Not Christ motivation, crisis motivation. That's a tough classroom to be in. Because everything I try to do, especially speaking to you, is to prepare you for your future. I don't want you to go, oh no, what, did, what was that teaching about prayer? What did, I took a nap and I slept through it. And now you're in a battle. And now I'm not prophesying you're going to have battles, but more than likely something's going to come up. Surprise. Amen. Are you here? Or are you... Okay, well, go to Matthew 18. Again, say it again. Matthew 18. Now this is, you'll like this verse right here. Well, you like all verses, right? All these verses are your favorites. Hmm. Verse, uh, well, 18 and 19. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, that's the prayer of binding and loosing. Did anybody in here ever do that? I know I do when I go into places and I know the possibility something could get weird or somebody in there is weird. I, I just bind that spirit. I don't bind that person and I don't say it in, in front of them unless they're a Christian and they know me. But I say I bind that argumentative spirit in Jesus' name. Okay? It's okay to do that. You have spiritual authority. All right? So that's a, a recommendation. But verse 19... Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. The prayer of agreement. The prayer of agreement. Again, I say to you that if whatever two of you agree on, that's powerful. That works. You find somebody who has faith like you do, and you agree on the word, or you lose something from its assignment on your life. But that's just a, that's a whole other teaching on prayer. That's, that's proactive prayer. That, that's really good to have. Uh, I'm caught by the first word in that 19th verse. Again, I say to you, what does that imply? Help me out. What does that mean if Jesus said to his disciples, okay, boys, again, it means he told them before, didn't he? Now, we don't have any proof if they had forgotten it or if he was just hammering the point home. I would like to think his disciples were sharp enough. But then again, what if, what if 10 out of the 12 got it, but the other two didn't? So this repetition is not a bad thing. It, it's not. Jesus with his disciples, again I say to you, uh, in, in 19, Matthew 19 and 24, he says the same thing. Again I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be rich. It means you can't trust in your riches. You still need faith in God regardless of your circumstance. Okay? Again, I say to you. Again, what does that imply? Yeah? Hmm. Again, I say. I know when I played uh, 
organized sports, it was like we did the same drills over and over and over. It's like, we got this, coach. No, you think you've got it, but I'm getting you to the place where you do it without thinking about doing it. That, that uh, began to work. Again, I say unto you, amen. So the repetition, the process leads you to success. Now, it doesn't mean we just stick on one sermon and go around it and around it, uh, but sometimes I'll preach on the same thing for week after week until I feel the Lord release my spirit. You know, you know, one of the biggest mistakes a pastor can make is to assume anybody knows anything that they've taught them. Now, I'm not being disrespectful saying that, but just because I taught a lesson on something, I can't assume you got it. You might have half of it. You might be trying to sort it out how it works for you, or you could have just been totally distracted and, and been, you know, the cares of the world or the battle that you're in or, you know, don't sit too far in the back because you look at everybody's back of everybody's head. And you wonder, who did their hair? That's why I sit up front. Of course, and I like to sit up front because of the, the beautiful ADD that I have because it's, it's harder to be distracted up here than it is in the back. In the back, it's easy to be distracted. Now, if I want to just goof off in church, I'll sit in the back. For the record, Jeff's not goofing off back there. He's on duty. All right, go to Psalm 60. So when you hear messages on prayer and on faith and on heaven, could it be, again, I'm saying to you? Now, there's a process here. The first one uh, that I told you about is it's possible to let things slip. It is. It's possible to forget things. There's a lot in this Bible, okay? Okay. And sometimes when something preached, it, maybe at that moment it doesn't apply to you. Like, have you ever heard me talk to the, the young married men about being married? And for women and for single men, they're going, what's that all about? Well, you wait till you're in his shoes. And you'll wish I talked about being a husband. It's a tough, tough job. It is. It's a great job, but it's a tough job. Should I call it a job? <laughs> April this morning, I told him, marriage is hard. It's hard work. <laughs> so you could, you could forget, and the Holy Ghost is so, he's so amazing, especially in the art of preaching and the skill of preaching, is I could bring something to your remembrance and you'll go, oh yeah, 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 I remember that. That's coming back to me. That's, that's one way the repetition's good. The other way the repetition is good is I'm just driving this deeper into your spirit. In a nice way. I'm not, you know, not like, you get it? Isn't that good preaching? No, but faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. So if I sense that something needs to be Gone over again. I, you know, when I was younger, it used to bug me. But now that I'm a little older and more experienced, I'm like, I know exactly what's going on. I don't care if they don't think I know that I preached this last week or not. I don't know. Uh, Stephen will remember. He's been around here forever. Uh, in fact, we found him on this property when we bought it. No, he, he came when we were in Parchment. I keep driving it in. Uh, but when I was younger, I thought the, 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 the expressions of people's faces that if I repeated something, you know, on the inside, I was like, oh, they know I'm doing this. But then I got past that. Uh, Stephen will remember this. Uh, there would be times I would take the pulpit at any given service. I usually did it on Sunday morning, but I would say, anybody remember what I preached last Sunday? And if I didn't get the answer within seconds, my mind immediately said, I get to preach that again. I get to preach it again. That's where they started writing stuff down, didn't they? If I ask that question now, he'll open up his notebook and say, this morning you preached about, but I worked harder than them. I don't let them cheat anymore. I like to see uh, the other people kind of get nervous because isn't it amazing you can remember when your feelings got hurt six months ago? But a sermon from last Sunday, you, 
It's like, where'd they go? What was it? It's, don't be on automatic pilot when you come in here. Maybe next Sunday I'll preach about the alligator and the duck. You never heard that sermon? You'd remember it if I would have. The alligator, his name was Charlie. The duck, his name was Lucky. <laughs> Did he make it? Why do you think they call him Lucky? Can, can I tell you a funny story? There was a salesman driving down a country road. And he looked out of his window, and there was a three-legged chicken running beside him in the, uh, in, on the road. So he, it's my story. Let me tell it. Three. How many legs does chickens have? Usually two. But anyway, uh, the chicken was going as fast as the car, so the guy, the salesman in the car punched the gas and pulled ahead, and that chicken passed him again. And then the chicken made a left turn and, and, and ran up this dr long driveway. And so the salesman followed it up the driveway. And uh, there was an old farmer there, and he said to the farmer, he said, did I just see a three-legged chicken go by here? He said, you sure did. He said, we breeded them. We breed them. And he said, why do you breed three-legged chickens? <coughs> he said, I like the drumstick. Mama likes a drumstick. Junior likes the drumstick. So we developed a three-legged chicken. And the salesman asked the farmer, how does it taste? He said, I don't know. We haven't caught him yet. <laughs> Wait till you hear the alligator story. Or I could tell you the story about the two brothers. One's name was Rusty, handsome, redhead kid. And his brother's name was Krusty. He was not as handsome as Rusty. Okay. All right, I won't tell you that story. I can tell right now. You're, you're not ready for it. <laughs> Did you find Psalm 60, or do you want me to <coughs> test your limits more? Verse 1, O oh God, you have cast us off. You have broken us down. You have been displeased. O oh, restore us again. O oh, restore us again. Bring us back. Now, see, I don't want to speak this over you in that way, but if you ever get off track with God, you have a right to say, restore me, please. I, I want to be where I was at. I'm, I, 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 bat, I, I slid back. Restore me. So it's powerful. Listen, when you break fellowship with God, you can ask to be restored, to right fellowship with him. May, may the revival heat of God come to this house that it's, it's, it's felt and experienced in all sorts of ways, and the miracles happen because of it. But we can say, Lord, restore us. You ever feel like you're out of gas or you're not where you want to be? Just ask for a, to be restored. And he'll start bringing things your way. Now, go to 1 Samuel. I, I referenced this, and I want to give you the verse for it. Can I do that? You remember me mentioning Samuel? That's a cool story. We got into it a little bit Wednesday night. That was interesting one. We found out scripturally that women can be mean. <laughs> I didn't know. I thought they were all sweet and kind. I didn't know that they were competitive. And I had brothers. I grew up with brothers. I already knew they were mean. <laughs> All right, here's the story, Cam. You don't know this one yet. I went on a mission trip with the youth of this church. At that time, I didn't know Rachel other than, hey, Rachel, what's happening? So around the, the place, Rachel was just doing her goofy Rachel stuff, so I'd take my camera. And I'd get a picture of her chewing with her mouth open or picking her nose or whatever you were doing. Never. I'm fibbing on that. I'm exaggerating. You ne I never got a picture of you picking your nose because that would be worth about 10 grand. <laughs> and so she, I guess she didn't think it was funny. And I've always known her to be quiet, and submitted and humble. 
They took us to a uh, cheesecake place. It was ice cream, uh, a cheesecake. Frozen cheesecake. Frozen cheesecake on a stick. Yes. Glory. Next thing I know, Rachel comes up to me and says, look at this video, Pastor. We went from pictures to videos. And, and as I stood in line looking at the board, and I zeroed in on key lime pie, I went, <laughs> I did. I went, that's that's my that's my kill motion right there. I went, oh, get out of the way. <laughs> and Rachel, she was like David with Goliath's head. I thought this girl's tough, man. I'm not messing with Rachel no more. It's a true story, isn't it, Rachel? You probably still have the video somewhere. To be terrible if that got lost. Lord, could you erase that from her phone? <laughs> you saw it already? Have you seen it, Shelly? No, it's nothing you need. You just saw me. I remember that. I, I, I recall that very clearly. Let's see, 1 Samuel. Let's leave the frozen cheesecake. Oh, my goodness. Verse 1, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation, and it came to pass while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he said, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and and laid down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son, lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord uh, revealed to him. So who did he think that voice was? So uh, my point this morning was, like when I hear Dr. Barkley's voice or I hear Dr. Summerall's voice or any other preacher's voice, I can say that's God speaking to me because they're my pastors they're who I'm submitted to in my life. Uh, and yet God can speak to me how, whatever way he wants to. I, I'm cool with that. But this little boy, and he, he's no dummy, he hears this voice and he, and he thinks it's the prophet and he goes to the prophet. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he rose and went to Eli and he said, here I am for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak Lord for your servant hears. Now you can claim this verse right here. Speak Lord, I'm listening. We usually do all the speaking. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down uh, in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. So in this passage, we see a couple things. That Eli's voice was in the line of God's voice. He wasn't God. But this boy thought it was him. Finally, the third time, he said, Next time this happens, you say, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Okay, so there's a parallel there. Uh, The second thing I want you to see is how many times did God call this young man? It was the fourth time that he answered him, right? Right? Isn't that cool? Now, aren't we glad that God has mercy and he is patient? Aren't you glad he didn't say, I called him, he didn't answer, let's move on. And so God's very gracious about if you're not able to hear him, understand him, or perceive him, he'll he'll keep knocking at your door one way or the other. But there is no promise in the Bible that he will continually call you, especially if you're in rebellion. Now, I know we don't like to talk about that word because that sounds so hard and vicious, but it is possible to say, no, God, I'm not going any further than that. This is all I'm doing for you, and God's trying to get you to go further. So there's no promise that, that I can say, I'll take five years off and then God will call me again. No. 
I'm fully convinced of this, that if I was to, my life was to end right now, God has somebody else that could do this. Tall guy, 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, nah, we don't want no tall preacher in here. So I just keep walking humbly with God. Not like I'm the only one that can do this. Okay, but I, I have a favor with you. I can't preach like this everywhere I go. I try. I usually do. I don't conform to too much. That's why they like me to come because I'm... Okay, well. God called Samuel three times. And God will continue to call those who will listen. But God will not continue to call the rebellious. So we're going to clearly stay out of the, the lane of rebellion. That's not... Have you ever experienced this uh, one way or another, whether it was a dream, a sermon, something you saw, and you just didn't pay any attention to it, and then later in the day or week you went, man, that was God speaking to me. I didn't know that. I, that, I miss the Lord. I hate saying that, and I hate doing that even more because I, I, I'm of the opinion that God is constantly trying to speak with us. Yeah, I saw a little girl the other day. Uh, my granddaughter had a soccer game, seven-year-old, real cute, and she's a feisty little one. Uh, but at that soccer game, there was a young lady, she was probably a teenager, maybe early 20s, but when I looked at her, I thought it was Rebecca Thompson. It was a pretty little girl out at the soccer field, and she looked like Rebecca until uh, I got about five foot from her, until I was hugging her, then she slapped me. She, no, I didn't hug her. Okay, I don't hug strangers. I barely hug the people I love. <laughs> but, but I saw that, that face and I thought, I'm going to pray for Rebecca right now. Because I'm pretty sure if I was to tell Kevy, go look at the little girl in the blue hoodie. She looks just like Rebecca. Kevy would say, what's wrong with you? That don't look like Rebecca. But at that moment, it looked like, that, like her. And I just thought, well, Father, I'm going to pray for Rebecca right now, right on the soccer field. So I'm the guy who stood in the corner. No, I was discreet. I was cool. Wasn't that funny? I would advise you don't do that at the soccer field. Even if you're playing church league. Got it? <laughs> you, can, you can do it softly, but under your breath. You know, so people aren't looking at you. But I pray that you guys are... are Lean that way. You're quick to pray. You're, you, you, I want you to be very much aware that at any time, and it's not spooky, but God can give you an unction, a thought, an idea, make you do something out of your normal routine, and there you are. Uh, go to Acts, the 10th chapter. Yeah, three-legged chicken. You know what, Sunday I'm going to say, Anna, what was my joke last Sunday night? And you're going to say something like, you know, Pastor, I worked all week trying to get that out of my brain. <laughs> no? You better not preach someday and tell that joke, and then everybody laughs like, she is the coolest. I'll tell them I came If they boo you, you'll say you're Pastor. Well, down on Portage Road there, I think the, that farmer opened up a place that's called Turbo Chicken. Okay, all right, you want to be that way. Uh, I, can, I can be tough. Acts, the 10th chapter, is where salvation comes into the Gentiles, okay? Oh, do I need to read the whole thing? I'll just start with verse 9. The next day they went on their journey and drew near the city. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while he, they made ready, he fell asleep. Hey, hey, that's a nap before dinner time. Biblical. He fell into a trance and saw heaven opened up and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and, and it let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, 
Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Because he was Jewish, right? And the voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times. How many times was it done? And the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, that would be an amazing thing to see. I don't know how big this sheet is, but all those animals in it. And, and Peter resisted three times. The Lord told him, don't call unclean what I've cleaned. You can eat pork now, hallelujah. You can have bacon and sausage. Glory. Shandai. Okay, are, are you there? Okay. He told him three times. Verse 17, now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. That's powerful. And you know what happens after this. He travels with them. And they all get saved. But I want you to see in here, how many times did God speak to Peter about what I've cleansed? Don't call it uncommon. Three times. So listen, if you don't get it your first time, you're in good company. Okay? Now, may we dial it in quicker. Um, Here's a safety note. Let's just say, for instance, that you do have a dream or you hear something or you heard something say and you can't put the pieces together, but it's not leaving you. This is where eldership and leadership and pastorship works in your life. If you came to me and said, I had a dream and this is what I saw, somebody that's more spiritual mature might say, well, this could mean this, this could mean this, or uh, don't, don't act on it yet until another confirmation comes. Or, and that gives you safety. Now, once again, since Stephen has seniority here, he'll remember this story. We had a lady in our church a long time ago. This when we had the parchment building. And uh, we had a strange lady. This one particular instance. And she was always real spiritual and all this. And one day I said, hey, where's so-and-so at? And they said, Pastor, she's in the hospital. I said, she's in the hospital? Oh, no. What happened? Apparently, this is in the dead of winter. She lived downtown by what's a Bronson Park. And she said... She said, God told her to walk through the park barefooted like at two in the morning on a bitter, bitter cold night. What was the result of it? On her feet. I pray she didn't say, I am a member, Pastor Scott's flock. Hey, what do you think I would have told her if she would have said, God told me to go barefoot in the snow? What do you think I would have said? Huh? No, I I would say, why? How do he speak to you? I mean, I'm not to question everything of God, but he's never told anybody else to do that. Isn't that strange? Stephen would have told him, no, I don't think so. Maybe put some boots on, big thick socks, wear a coat. But I don't think God takes any pleasure in us getting, doing that. She could have saved herself a lot of, and there's a gracious way to say, "Mm, that might not be God. I'm pretty sure. Let me pray about it. If he tells me it's cool, then I'll drive the ambulance. Now, that's goofy. You you wouldn't do that, would you? No? What if he said, I want you to walk, walk, walk the white sands of the beaches in Florida? You might quicker say, now I think that's God speaking to me. That's sounding more like heaven right here. We, one of my favorite places to pray is on the beach over the Gulf of Mexico. They, they can't hear, nobody can hear me praying because of the water, but yet when you see that expanse of water, it just, it just reaffirms how mighty God is. And I just find it very naturally, my family will tell you, I'll go for a walk. And I'll pray. I'm so spiritual, aren't I? So Peter, how did be told? How many times? Three times. Don't argue with me. So there is a window. If, if 
somewhere in your destiny because sometimes leaving your comfort zone is scary. Leaving the place that you know everything about is scary. Now, I'm not talking about walking in the park in the winter with no shoes on. I'm talking about what if, what if all of a sudden you get desire to lead prayer and pre-service prayer, but you're not really like that. Do you think God could be behind you, gently pulling you up here? It's happened again, again, again. So I thank God that I might miss his voice or his leading, but as long as my intent stays right, he'll get it across to me. But once again, I have to rest that on. God could speak to me at any time. I mean, like before I preach, it's a good thing to have a sermon or two, an outline already, but it's not uncommon for, like Kevy will tell you, I'll give her a copy of my notes, and then when I'm done, she says, you didn't preach at all from this thing. I'll say, oh. Or she'll say, you started at the end and worked your way from eight to one. It's the Holy Ghost. And he speaks to everybody. Now, uh, write this verse down. Old Testament, Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Or do you want to read it? Because so, this is an important. Go to, go to Genesis 26. You know where that's at? That's right by Psalms? No? It's by the minor prophets? We're going to get you to learn your Bible. Where you get to the point where you just say to your Bible, Acts 10, and it opens up. I've wore out a few Bibles in my day, and it's amazing. The older they get, they open to different passages because that's where I'm usually spend a lot of my time. All right, let me get to this here. Genesis 26, verse 18. Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. Well, I got to read this whole thing. This is so cool. Verse 10. Now, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, so he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down on that place to sleep. You know what that means? He likes a firm pillow. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached the heaven to heaven, and there were angels of God who were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land of which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and east, to the north and south, and in you, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Out in the desert. God can be anywhere. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he'd put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. All right. Then Jacob made a vow saying, God, if God will be with me and keep me uh, in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, it, this stone, oh goodness, I'm sorry, let me read this. And this stone, which I've said is a pillar, shall be God's house, and it shall be, and you, excuse me, and of all you give me, I will surely give you a tenth to you. That's the tithe. Now, the sad part about this story is I was supposed to read from chapter 26. But that was still good stuff right there. Didn't hurt anybody, did it? No. <laughs> I'm all shook up from telling the ice cream story, okay? I'm... I'm just human, okay? It's okay. But she's 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 glear, has this gleam on her face like I got you. You've seen the look before. That wasn't it. Then I don't want to see it. 
All right, 26. Help the preacher out here. Verse 17. I'll give the verse. You calm down here. <laughs> verse 17. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Now, historically what happened here is water was a life source, and as soon as Abraham was dead, the, the Philistines filled that up with rocks. So they couldn't have, have this source of life. The wording I want you to see in here is, Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. Now, the good news of this verse is we're not going to go out back and dig a well. Okay? That's hard work. They have machines to do it now. I don't know how they did it then. Uh, but spiritually, you can reopen different truths in your life. Uh, if you've let things slip, God will allow you to dig them up again. Have you ever gotten to the place where you said, Lord, what was that that was said? What was the, what was the principle behind that? What was point three of that? Um, it, it's okay to do that very, very much if you've let things slip. Now listen, if you get offended or you get caught up being real religious, you're going to have to reopen some wells. That's wonderful. You could, you could, you could pray. Now, you can't control me. You can't manipulate me. God, God, make pastor preach about this and make him preach about that. That doesn't work. That's manipulation. But you could pray whatever area in your life that, that you need help in. You could say, could, could I hear some preaching about prayer or faith? Or could I hear what to do after you reset? And that's how I get my sermons. Most of the time. Other times, if, I, if you're a mess, I'll preach about how to not be a mess. Okay? If you're all sick all the time, I'm going to preach on healing. And then the next week on healing. And then I got to preach it again because two-thirds of the church was sick the second time I preached on healing, and they didn't get it. And, and so we can reopen wells. We can do it with, with our worship. That's what I, I love about our worship. We sing new stuff, some of that powerful old stuff. Nothing wrong with it. Every time we sing one of those old hymnals, man, it takes me back to when I first heard them. That was a long time ago. Remember I told you this morning, I didn't know how to worship when I got saved. I mean, I knew how to go to concerts, but that wasn't the same. And so I didn't realize this worship was about me and God. Anyway, that's cool. But you can reopen wells. May that happen. But let's see. Let's see. My math guys aren't here tonight. One's at a barbecue and one's ministering. How many sermons do you think you've heard in your lifetime? Thousands? Rachel, you've been in church all your life. How many sermons have you heard? Did you ever hear the one about not taking videos of your pastor? No, you didn't hear that one. Have you heard 100? 500? Probably. Maybe 1,000? Easy? Easy? All right, just start naming all the ones that you've heard. <laughs> Do you remember when Pastor Crabb preached for us? He's hard to forget. Remember he told the story about the guy dying in church? You remember, how many sermons have you heard? How many applied to you? <laughs> Tay, how many of you heard? You were born on a Saturday and in church on Sunday. She's been a church kid all her life. And you're 17, 18? 26. That's pretty good. Not counting midweek services. Oh, he's going to wish her happy birthday. Oh, you got the stuff. You have the goodie bag. Now we know. So would it be safe to say we've all heard thousands of sermons? 
and maybe we can remember the subject or title, but some of the details. Dig that well up again. That's why I said this morning, pull out some of them old notes. Buy, get, get one of my uh, preaching CDs or, or cassette tapes. Remember cassette tapes? And listen to me from 10 or 15 years ago. You'll go, man, that guy was, he was rough. <laughs> or you might say, he hadn't changed at all. I was told one time, you've changed. And I thought, I had some elders, have I changed? No, it wasn't me that changed. Unless God upped me, you know. So we can reopen those wells. Uh, again, remember, repetition is safety. Now, a dangerous place to be is where you always have to have something new. Now, I know God can show us something new anytime, uh, but I would just like to polish off some of the stuff he's already shown me. That's, that's why I, uh, this is the proper way to use these words. Uh, that's why I covet the words Dr. Summerall spoke to me. So I covet the words Dr. Barkley speaks to me. So I covet the words Roy Hicks spoke to me, et cetera, et cetera. I, it's amazing. Like, I can forget what dinner was three nights ago, but I can remember them saying these exact words to me. You know why? Because I, I keep them alive. I talk about them. It's pretty cool. It's a, good, it's, it's a good thing to have. Let's see. Go to Galatians 5. I'll give you one more verse. Finally, my brethren. <laughs> Two people got that. I was trying to give you hope. Now, if you've been around here, when you hear me say, finally, brethren, you think, oh, great, 20 minutes. It's like the last two minutes of an NFL football game. <laughs> and Charity doesn't laugh at that. You've never watched NFL football, have you? The last two minutes take about 45 minutes, don't they, Tim? Let's see. Where did I say? NFL football? Galatians 5. Ooh. Let's see. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Mm, hallelujah. Come on, say it. I'm free. I'm free. Who made you free? Christ, the anointed one, his anointing. Has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of what am I not to do? What does entangled mean? Get caught up in it? Maybe accidentally at first, maybe unaware at first. So I have a warning here to stay in my liberty that Christ has got for me, but I'm also warned as a Christian, don't get entangled in that stuff again. Don't think you can dive in the, in the septic tank and not come out stinking. Oh, you know what a septic tank is, right? Glory to God. You know, we, when we built this building, we were going to put a septic tank in. And we had a man in our church who was a contractor. He was an excavating contractor, Tad Bird. And he said, Pastor, I want to hook it up to the sewer so your church will never, this church will never have a problem again. They won't ever have to. And uh, I said, that's cool, but the bid we got for that was $80,000. He said, no, no, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm using my equipment, my labor, and I'll buy the material." That's a true story. And I just said there as a young man going, well, golly. You don't remember that? Now, every time you flush the toilet, say, God bless Tad Bird. He's in, he he's in heaven now. That's pretty cool. But you know what happened to him after he sowed that seed? Oh, he started getting jobs, jobs, and jobs. I mean, he was already pretty busy, but he got some, some better jobs that were less complicated but paid heavier just for this church. That's cool. That's... And so why can't that happen again? Why can't that happen four more times? Why, why, can't, why, why can't that? It can, it can happen, can it? But we're not going to get entangled with this stinking world. 
Okay, I'm free. I'm going to stay free. All right, close your Bibles. Yeah, we're going to have a septic tank and well water. Now we have city water and city sewer. And next we're going to put a beautiful driveway over it. Yeah? And whatever else we want to do. Yeah? All right, stand to your feet. Glory. I look around the room tonight and I see five of the six Elliot's children. There's one that's bugging me. We're going to pray for him. Okay? Can we? It'll be a sweet. Bless him. Let him sleep well. No? May his eyes be opened? Come to yourself? That's a Bible verse, you know. Well, I thought about him this afternoon. And uh, this might sound selfish, but I, I said in my own reflection, I have too much invested in that kid. I have spent hours and hours with him. I even pretended I liked him. <laughs> Goofy little kid. <laughs> I took him to Waffle House. He'd never been to Waffle House. Him and Jaden. They'd never been to I bought their meal. I bought them a waffle. Of course, they ate much more than a waffle. Good Lord. But I'm not letting go of him. Okay? Is that okay to say that? I, I love him. All right, Father, thank you for this night we've had together. We, we see the value in repetition and going over things and opening up old wells. I thank you for revelation knowledge bursting forth from your people from what they already know. And Father, we hold Daniel Elliot before you. We claim him a a as a Christian. We plead the blood of Jesus over him right now. But I ask for the Holy Spirit to begin ministering conviction to him that he has never had before. Stir up every memory of church, the Bible, what this church has done for him. Let his eyes be opened. We command these scales to fall off of his eyes that he may see destiny in front of him. And I ask that you send people across his path that would influence him, that would speak to him. And Lord, I do ask, may he not have peace until he makes a decision. Uh, no danger for him, but, but may he know the hand of God is upon him. King David said, where can I go where your spirit is not? I can't go here, I can't go there, you're everywhere. So we're asking for Holy Ghost visitation, in the name of Jesus, amen, and we thank you for it. Amen. That was a sweet little prayer, wasn't it? Break those things off of him. That's how those old timers taught me to pray.